we are recording a designing design from trust call. Uh, uh, nominally, the topic is what does design from trust maybe look like as a personal practice? But, but Kabir, if you have other things you'd like to talk about, we can we can go we can as usual trot anywhere over the terrain. Happy to happy to go any place, um, or and also happy just to listen to what what reflections you have on on things at this point. Well, I'm really excited to. to to learn more on what's in your brain about design from trust. And maybe just as a starting point, I can reflect for you. I was thinking about this question um, after our last conversation with Eric and Raj and um, realizing that, that in a sense, in that context, we're designing from trust. Mm -hmm. We really have no idea what we're doing with each other in the room. We just trust one another. Like, four strangers really have come together and are trusting each other and committing time and energy to some sort of an emergent design. And, and so I'm not sure that that's precisely what you had in mind when you kind of coined the phrase, but um, I was really looking for where can we see design from trust and, and care maps and whatever else we're working with showing up in that context. And so I'd love to hear any reflections from you about that or, or how do you see us there designing from trust or what does that spark you to, to share and help clarify my understanding of what you see? That's lovely, that's a, that's a really nice example. And, and I hadn't thought about it from the perspective of design from trust, but it very clearly, I mean, we're, you know, there's, there's for whoever listens to this later, there, there's four of us who've only just met um, a few of us met at the Quantified Self Conference that was just a couple weekends ago here in Portland. And it, a conversation got sparked there that we are now continuing online. Uh, and each of us is really pretty different from everybody else. We have some, some really interesting, juicy sort of shared interests in the middle of, of our, our own paths and our own interests. Uh, and that have to do with, you know, fixing the world and with mapping, using mapping, uh, as a way for people to express connections and care and a whole series of other things. And I, th I think that maybe our, our emergent goals in this conversation are overlappy, but maybe not so much, but, but we're approaching this wholeheartedly in, in a way of saying, well, um, what might we invent together? Which is, which is, which is really exciting because it's, it's completely intrinsic. It's like we're, we're here because we, we want to, and we really love this conversation and we, we like admire the people who are in it and uh, it's been really fun. So, so as one of the basic principles of design from trust is assume good faith, right? I'm, I'm borrowing that from open, from the open source community and from other places that have done this, but, but uh, you know, there's two kinds of people in the world. I hate that, but it's always fun to bring up. Um, there's those who believe that there are two kinds of people and those that don't get it. They're exactly that. Um, and in this case, there's, uh, and there's probably three kinds here in, in what I'm about to say, which is those who believe that people are born good and basically that, that our people are looking to do good, look, not looking to harm others. Uh, there's those who believe that people are born evil and given any opportunity will, you know, abscond with the jewels or, or cause mayhem. And probably the third category is those who don't feel strongly about this and are just, there's probably a large, you know, pool of people in the middle who are like, meh, I don't know, but occasionally I feel optimistic, occasionally I feel pessimistic. So I guess it's not, you know, it's not that binary. Um, but I think that the presumption here is like, let's assume that people are born good because, because really good things start to happen if you start from that assumption, merely. And, and like, I'm not a big fan of game theory I think game theory is a very male way of looking at social dynamics and it kind of freaks me out because it doesn't assume ongoing relationships. It doesn't assume a whole bunch of stuff that actually happens in the real world, right? Because I would behave very differently if I knew that I'd bump into you next week, for example, in most game theoretic kinds of constructs. Um, but in game theory, it turns out in sort of a tit for tat kind of arrangement, uh, the move of doing something good first is like the winning move. That's the winning play in a tit for tat kind of game in game theory. I run out of what I know about game theory pretty quickly. Um, but lots of interesting things become possible if you approach most situations uh, from the assumption that everybody there is trying to do some good. 
uh, and would like to connect and figure out their role and their way forward and whatever that might be. And even, even when bad things happen, um, interpreting them gracefully, sort of like, you know, there, there's plenty of wise sayings that go roughly, you know, be, be gentle with everybody whose path you cross. You don't know what their day has been like, what their life is like. Right. So, so even if they lash out or do something or, or whatever, there's probably a reason behind it. And each of us is the center of our own little universe. And, and all of the, the like wrinkly detail that I have about me and my goals and my life and my relationships, you have as well. And everybody else out there has right now. Yeah. There's a point you just raised. I'd like to apply a little pressure to you. Sure. And see what happens there. And it had to do with good intent. And the way that I tend to think about good is that good is the emergent result of a negotiation between two subjects pursuing their own version of beauty. And when our versions of beauty intersect, that's a, that intersection is good. And so there's two pieces to what you said. One was assuming good intent. And inside of that, I think there's the, there's the assumption of the intersection of beauty. And mm -hmm. then the other piece was... Um, when something uncomfortable arises, um, I forget what you, how you framed it, the, some sense of having a degree of patience and um, maybe humility and, and compassion for that event. And I might be trying to be too scientific with this, but I think we do a lot of assuming good without unpacking the underlying perspectives of beauty that are at play. I, I love that the Native American frame is you know, to walk a beauty way. Hmm. You know, when I sit down to work on capital construction or to do the books or to send some emails or to organize files or to have a meeting with somebody for me, it's becoming more and more important in my life that that is in alignment with walking a beauty way, mm -hmm. which means that what I'm engaged in has to first and foremost commit to the beautiful world I want to live and create. And that, that, that for me has to be non-negotiable. Somebody wants me to do something ugly, I better be doing it for a higher beauty purpose in myself and not for somebody else's thought of good. And, um, and I, I, this is a theoretic, but I have never seen that I can think of any evidence to suggest that anyone anywhere has ever done anything that they thought was probably the lesser good option for them. If they, if, from, from where they stood, if they saw I can go this way or I can go this way and going this way is going to be worse than going this way. I don't think anybody has ever gone this way. Hmm. They may have convoluted reasoning. Mm -hmm. You might be able to stand objectively outside of them and say, well, that's a really bad decision you're making. But if you investigate their reasoning, I, I can't believe because I don't think I've ever done it myself that I've been, that I've seen clearly two paths and I've gone, I'm going to take the path that brings me less and hurts more. Mm -hmm. I, that's sort of the definition of altruism some kind, sometimes. Like you give something up so that someone else might have something. Now, there's but, also but interesting conversations. Still, I conversation. want them to have that thing, right? Well, there's interesting conversations about altruism because your win is they're having the thing and you're happy because of that. But, but 
but utilitarian perspectives on that, say that you just gave up something you actually really wanted. Yeah, but I think that's, that, that gets to be a little bit like with the weaknesses of game theory. Like utilitarian isn't useful if it doesn't actually address what's really happening. Yeah, yeah. And it, it doesn't get to enough of the narrative or the benefit or the whatever. And, and the reason that I bring this up is if you and I are working together, I don't have to trust that you're going to design with our shared sense of good in mind. In fact, I can count on that's not what you're doing if we haven't defined that together. Mm -hmm. If we have left the good between us to be implicit and not co-created in a conscious way, then I can ensure almost certainly that you're pursuing the path that to you seems the most beautiful. And if I run into a place where our shared intersection fails, it's not because you're trying to do bad. That's a projection I might make that would actually just be a a way of degrading the situation. But it's because you're trying to do a good that I don't understand. And so if it, if it violates a shared commitment to a defined good, then, then I can investigate the clarity of that shared commitment. And if we don't have that shared commitment or it doesn't violate that, but doesn't feel good, then I can investigate what is the good that you're trying to advance and decide if I want, if that's something I want to align with and continue with. So I guess that the pressure there for me is just that that all feels very pragmatic and clear and it doesn't feel like a, there's any leap of faith that I have to make. There's no trust that I have to make except that, I mean, even, I don't know, this, maybe it gets to the whole Jesus thing about turn your cheek, give them the other, you know, like even if you're lying to me about what, what our shared vision is, like, doesn't that fall on me to be skillful to discern what good are you pursuing with that lie? Mm -hmm. Anyway, that, that just, I guess, triggered a lot, so. Yeah, yeah. No, you've put like five really beautiful things in the conversation, including the concept of beauty here and walking a beauty way, which I really like. Um, one, and, and, and also you're really bringing to light the idea that if we haven't discussed what, what good means between us, um, and if we don't begin to get an idea of our shared notions of that good, then we're probably only working at our own purposes. And that may or may not work for the other person, but, but the, the, the mutual benefit really only arises when we start to figure out where the mutuality is. Um, I like that a lot. <clears throat> One thing that came to my mind really early in what you were saying was that this notion of good or good intent or good faith um, is often really messed up because uh, you know, my mom always wants to do things for my good, uh, but for a really long stretch of our life, I didn't want her to do those things. And, and she was, in her mind, they were the only useful things she knew how to do for me. So she forced me to accept them. And it didn't work so well, and it's still not working so well to this very day. Um, but she was acting in good faith. I don't doubt that. It's just that her information about what was good and her ability to listen to me say that is not good were broken, are broken, right? And, and couple that with probably her ability at her age to find other ways to do good, to, to be flexible in some way, to learn some new thing, to listen with care, all those kinds of things probably aren't, aren't there at this point, but they would have been there like 20 years ago when this kind of started. Um, so, so good is kind of both relative to what we understand how to be like, like I, I really like the question, what does it mean to be a good friend, mm. right? Because for some people, I don't know what percentage that is. That means whatever you say, I agree, and I'm gonna back you and help you. And for other people, it means 
the moment I hear you say something that's probably going to harm you or those around you, I'm going to have to tell you that. And that's what it means to be a good friend. I might have to intervene at some point, right? So, so, and I think those are two really different conceptions of what like the friend dynamic is. And, and you could have very different notions of good faith depending on which of those visions you're entering a relationship with, for example. So what's your exposure to um, uh, stages of adult development? A um, bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I got the, the, you know, Psych 101 part of it and uh, a little bit more since then probably because I, you know, I, I'm interested in people like Alice Miller and uh, a bunch of others. So I, I, my, my exposure to that field comes from Suzanne Cook-Reuter and Bill Torbert and um, Robert Keegan and Lisa Leahy at Harvard and Terry O'Fallon more recently and her creative partner in that, Kim Barta. Um, drawn on uh, Piaget and, and some others. And um, in our conversation the other day, I mentioned the idea of the human species being a, a diverse evolutionary set. And the things that you just described about what it means to be a good friend to someone uh, actually fits very nicely into some of the distinct stage conceptions that those various researchers that I just described um, have modeled. And so when we talk about, you know, we should be a good family or we should be a good friend or we should be good citizens or we should be good global citizens uh, or good patriots, all of these things are translated very differently depending on the evolutionary state of someone's self-conception in their consciousness. And so when we talk about models like design from trust, if we don't take into consideration the different ways that these terms might be interpreted, it becomes violent. Much like you described with your mother and you, your mother and you likely come from different stages of consciousness development, living in the time that we do, it's likely that you have exceeded your mother's internal sense of self matrices in terms of how far yours has gone. And so she can't actually make tangible sense of a lot of the things that seem really important to you. And, you know, I've got some close friends that have had this problem recently with what's been happening in the news. Like, the tangible sense to be made from the Kavanaugh trial or thing felt like a distraction to them. It felt like, yes, yes, lots of that muddy stuff goes on. Why does it have to get, the, get in the way of doing something important like picking a Supreme Court justice? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. So how does design from trust deal with that? I know. Challenge. Let me go back for one second to the stages of development piece because that, that's just, a, it's a giant body of work at lots of different levels. So there's like Piaget and development of, of human development from you know, childhood through adolescence through adulthood. Then there's organizational or cultural stages of development and things like spiral dynamics and integral theory and all of that. And some of that makes me squirm uh, uh -huh. in, in a couple of different ways. So, so recently I've heard a term early adulthood and, and, and my own narrative here is that we keep extending childhood. Um, we, so one of, one of my uh, inspirations is a, a retired New York high school teacher named John Taylor Gatto, G-A-T-T-O. One of the things that Gatto does is he tells stories of very young people who did things of remarkable um, responsibility and, and cleverness. So, uh, David Farragut was our first admiral. Um, I used to tell the story that Farragut was put on board a ship, a warship at age 12 as a midshipman because he came from a naval family. And it turns out I was wrong when I went and fact checked myself, I was wrong. He was put on board a military vessel at age nine, at age nine, which was normal then. You were like the powder monkeys and, and, and you had 
rank over some of the able-bodied seamen because you were expected to become a captain or an admiral. You were, you, you know, a position was inherited in the British Navy and later the American, not later not in the American Navy, but, but anyway, so I come from a worldview that says that remarkably young people are capable of incredibly mature, connected, adult reasoning, logic, perception, et cetera. Our training education socialization systems tend to squish that out of us. They tend to actually remove a lot of the connectedness that we're born with. Mm -hmm. And so then we kind of have to retrain it back in or hope and pray that it didn't get stamped out or whatever else. And then our cultural assumptions, we, you know, it used to be that a high school diploma was enough to go out and get a job. Not anymore, you know, and, it, and an undergrad isn't enough anymore. You now need an advanced, you know, two to four to something degrees of advanced degree before you kind of get into a trade and get hired for a, you know, a well-salaried position of some sort. But, but, that, but we also sort of keep, we also have a lot of sort of adult children um, in particular, I think white men in the U.S. Leading us, for example. <laughs> for example, for example, like uh, orange-haired adult children um, who who aren't that aware, like, and they've gotten really old, and they like you know who knows what awareness they have of any of those issues. Although there's a complete separate discussion to be had about whether Trump is a, a lucky idiot or an evil genius, and I'd, I'd love to go there someday. Um, but the development models I see a lot tend to work the wrong way very often. Just like I see, whenever I see um, uh, Maslow's pyramid uh, uh, hierarchy of needs, um, I, I cringe because mostly it's used by people to say, see, poor people who don't have shelter have no aspirations for higher self-development. And I'm like, you know what, some of the most developed spiritual people I've ever met have very, 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 very little. And, and, and some of the laziest uh, mentally and otherwise people I've ever met have all those lower layers in the, in the pyramid fulfilled. So, so I'm, I'm a little leery of mental models. Some of them are really powerful and really helpful. Others are very messy. And, and, and I've been radicalized on a couple of those ideas, like the idea that very young people can be really connect, that we're, that we're born good and really like deeply connected to nature and to perception and that our socialization processes basically cut that away from us a lot. Um, and in fact, that the model that happens to rule in the world you grow up in, if you grow up in a feudal society, if you grow up in a tribe someplace, if you grow up in capitalism and consumerism, those things actually become the frameworks of your, of your mind about what's possible, how you see everybody else, what your goals in life are, all those things come out of the model you were just born into. And, and you know, 99% of the humans born into a model will adopt those goals and frames of, of, of what life is supposed to be like. And then the 1% become the philosophers and the criminals uh, and, and the kids who get sent to the principal's office because they see through the system and they're like, no, 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 this, this is wrong right? We, we, we got the wrong priorities here. This is not the best life we could possibly be having. So <laughs> these, these are like lots of digressions, but you're, you're provoking really, really interesting um, places to go here. I say a lot of this, and it's still really important to design from trust, because when I say trust, <clears throat> and when we say good faith or good, I think I'm making a whole bunch of assumptions behind the curtain about what trust ought to be like, what the good is, and where it goes, right? And, and when I look out in the world, a whole bunch of our institutions are designed from mistrust. And I can describe that, I can paint that, but I'm not sure that everybody can paint that because if you buy a lot of the assumptions of capitalism, for example, they don't look so bad. Well, you know, there's just one, there's one card I just wanna set up on the table, which is this idea that I like to entertain as a distinction between the pace of progress and the pace of integration. And we all live in, as you suggested, so many multi-layered stories of implicit assumption. I mean, we'd go to the principal's office because our story and the dominant story don't match. And 
at a species level, this works in order for a species to function and thrive. But at an individual level, it's a source of a lot of confusion. Because the species knows exactly what it's doing. If you can say it's got a brain or a mind of its own, which... If you can say that it knows anything, yeah. Yeah. But the individual, very easily arguable, has very little idea what they're doing most of the time. They're following a prescription, but the whys and wherefores that that arose, all a concealed mystery, often in the realm of things we don't know we don't know. And so designing, or excuse me, the pace of progress, which is reflected really well in capitalism as we know it today, and I think you mentioned there's many different forms of capitalism. I think that's fair. Um, but taken as a whole, capitalism is very much a linear goal-oriented process that seeks to move from a problem here to a solution there. And that's linear. And the sooner we're away from the process of the problem and arrived at the solution, the better. So we want to move at the pace of progressing along that linear trajectory. I'm not sure how linear I think capitalism is, but I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Okay. Um, Cause capitalism has done lots of stuff everywhere, sometimes all at once. Yes, but, it's but it, balancing it, 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 these contradictory forces and go goals. ahead. What was the last thing? It's balancing sort of these contradictory forces and goals. It's it does a lot of things. All, yes, all but it does it, it does most of that by externalizing things. Yeah, but not as maybe maybe linear is the word I'm I'm hung up on uh, in yeah. some way. Well, I I'm, so I equate capitalism with often with linear objective rationalism. By linear, you don't mean sequential. You mean just that cause follows effect, at least in the intention. What do you what do you what do you, what are you saying when you say linear? Because I'm hearing serial, like one thing happens before another happens, after, and then another happens, and, yeah. I, and I and I think that's if that's more complicated than that in capitalism. Well, I think that's a part of it, but capitalism is really about growing capital, right? To me, that's a linear process. The way it actually occurs in the lived experience is multidimensional. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't mean to, to take any of that away, but the, but the orientation is linear. It's from not enough capital to too much capital. So maybe also this means it's a, it's a vector that's pointing toward wealth. And, and, and that, that's the simple success function. Is that sort of part of, part of what you mean by, by linear? It is, and then the, the idea that, that much is negotiated in that process yeah. is a negotiation of what can we externalize without hurting our progress to that goal? Mm -hmm. And what do we have to integrate in order to achieve that goal? Okay. And I think... Ultimately, the flaw of capitalism is it externalizes too much. And, and, and that becomes the, the accumulative drag or friction that eventually brings capitalism itself to a halt. Like, my, li my list of the flaws of capitalism is a bit longer than yours then. But, uh, well, yeah, but I mean, it, like, basically, it eats the planet at a certain point. Yes, correct. And you're done. Oh, well, capitalism didn't work. Oops. Right there. Yeah. Um, And so I think that essence of capitalism in the sense as I've described it is a natural evolutionary uh, expression. I go from the beginning of my day where I don't have enough food for the end of the day and I don't have enough shelter for the end of the day and I haven't avoided enough predation for the end of the day to the end of the day where I've externalized everything I can in order to meet those basic needs. Well, also, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of Darwin's early theories of natural selection, et cetera, were used as justification for capitalism. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a real twinning 
mm-hmm. of the science of evolution as interpreted by lots of people and with lots of things ignored. I remember years ago, I decided, you know, who are these horrible anarchist people? I'm going to read something by an anarchist. So I picked up a book by Peter Kropotkin. And the first half of the book is all about mutualism and society in animals, and the termites and wolves. And he just goes through you know, species after species after species and look how they collaborate to make what they make. And I'm like, this is one of the dreaded anarchists. What's going on here? I mean, when I, when I use these things, I'm like picturing a hedgehog. Yeah. You know, I'm not trying to equate human beings and say that human beings just try to avoid predation and get food and get shelter. Yeah. I don't, I don't mean to reduce anybody to that. And I don't mean to reduce a hedgehog to that. But that's a much bigger part of a hedgehog's concern than it is mine on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. I'm, I, I watch the hawks all day long. I don't think for a moment that they might swoop down and eat me. That's true. That's true. And so, and, um, yeah, that has to do also with like Black Lives Matter and Me Too. Like, I'm a, I'm a white guy, and when I walk down the street, I don't, cross, I don't cross to the other sidewalk much because I all fear somebody. Kinds right? of concerns we don't have. Yeah. yeah. Um, but my point is that we express this part of what I think you're trying to address with design and trust is the collective expression of this linear process. Mm -hmm. It's in a way, it's a critique of particular expressions of that process. That's right. And and so I think that when we just kind of try and move quickly through our day, through our conversations, through our business initiatives, through our opportunities to make money or make a change or do something good for the world, we, we pursue this in a way that beautifully, in an evolutionary sense, advances as quickly as possible our vision of beautiful. Like if I could just get a bunch of flowers on my desk, that would be so beautiful. Right. Now, it's not a new thing at all to enjoy and take my time collecting the flowers. Capitalism would try and decorate the desk as quickly as possible. Because then I can probably show it off. I can sell 10 other people on decorating their desks. And if I can get that done in a week, then I can buy a Lamborghini. But what I've run into, and maybe this is speaking from my own pain, what I've run into in organizational contexts and many contexts is the pace of progress takes precedence over the pace of integration. And the pace of integration is almost certainly slower. What do you mean by integration? Well, it means that when you and I set out to do something, we actually slow down enough that we can take in moment by moment, when do those implicit assumptions of what's good present themselves? Hmm. Okay. So we don't rush by a hundred a minute. And when we do notice one coming up, we actually stop our progress in a linear sense to integrate that question. We haven't been doing that much in this conversation and that's been a source of tension and anxiety for me. Oh, okay. And I just, I, I have a tremendous amount of trust for you, and so I just kind of charge forward. But, but my point is that the pace of integration would be a very different conversation and lived experience mm-hmm. and society and wouldn't be designing from trust at all. It would be designing from very measured, very careful clarity. Like that. So of course, it would be designing from trust in some other sense, but. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, 
how much of integration is about permeability? Permeability? Mm -hmm. Say more what you mean. Um, am I permeable to your ideas? Do I shift in my ideas because of what you said? Do I receive them in a way that, and that folds them together and makes something better? Or am I just like, look, here's my priorities. This is what I believe. And I'm just going to kind of plow ahead. And if it fits, it fits. If it doesn't, it doesn't. See, I think this, my model of living right now, that is a question of how deeply integrated do I feel in my identity with the entire cosmos? Because if I'm feeling sufficiently identified with the cosmos, then you can't have a contradictory view. It's just my view that I haven't heard yet. Mm -hmm. And if I am feeling isolated in the cosmos, you almost can't have an idea that's good enough for me to integrate it. And so that, that feels like a, that feels like a personal accountability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What can we do right now to integrate better what we're doing and saying? I guess if I would, I would want to ask you to explore out loud. What is your highest hope for this conversation? I mean, you called us here together, so mm -hmm, we're all. Mm -hmm. um, and just the, the broad framing for this particular conversation is this idea called design from trust that took hold of my neurons some time ago that I would love to see expressed in the world uh, in as many ways as naturally play out. Um, so uh, the thing I sort of put in front of this call was what if, what if design from trust was a, a, was a personal practice? What does that mean? Sort of like Buddhism is a personal practice, right? Uh, and Buddhism involves meditation and meditation involves different, there's different forms of meditation. It's like, you know, you can point to a practice area and, and describe what parts it has. And here, uh, what does design from trust look like? So that, so, so one, maybe probably the most explicit goal for me is to flesh this out and see who shows up and see if anybody's really interested in playing out any of those ideas to a manifestation, then awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm like a play, playmate. I'm a total partner in doing that. Right. Then there's, there's like, then there's the, this hopeful uns, less spoken aspect of it, which is I came at this as, you know, a, a, a single naive individual and I've got my own thoughts about what it means. What does it mean to other people and, and what is behind it? Like what, and you're doing a beautiful job. Um, by, by your presence and the way you walk through ideas and present them in helping peel back some of those layers about um, what, what are sort of maybe my assumptions, our assumptions, what does this process look like, what role does it play in the larger picture, um, those kinds of things. Because, because I have a faith that poking into those places and letting, letting those permeate me, that letting, that letting those ideas in is going to broaden and deepen this whole concept and probably touch lots of other parts of what I do. Um, so, so I'm interested when something shows up that hasn't been in this conversation yet. And it's like, Oh, Oh, that sounds really interesting and valuable. And then just, uh, you know, the first reaction is how does it fit? Wow. What do we, what do I do? And then the, the, the next reaction is like, okay, let's just listen and see if we can figure out what this might mean. Uh, and let it sit for a while because it's going to take a you know it's going to take a while to turn into stew. It doesn't it doesn't cook together right away. I'm just checking here. Uh, do you have us on until five o'clock? I, I have us up for an hour. Um, there's no there's no you know we don't have to turn it off at five. Okay, great. Um, so I have a high level thing and a low level thing. Okay. I'd like to do so. I'll start with a high level thing. 
which is just to reflect back on your, forgive me if I call it allergy to developmental structures. My occasional skepticism of developmental structures. Excellent. How about that? Much better for me. Thank I'm, you. Not, I'm not allergic to them all. I think they're really useful. It's just that I've seen them break things that I believe in. Yeah, no, and I think they do. And um, I think that's a real danger. Um, and I'll actually be presenting on development to the local group here next weekend. But um, so yeah, like cards on the table. This has been an area I've been in, in, in immersed in studying for about 12 years now. Mm -hmm. And I started that study when I enrolled in a program that was designed explicitly, well, implicitly, it was, it was not explicit to the participants, it was explicit part of the design of the designers to see if they could move people in the integral model of development from uh, achiever to strategist by taking them through a leadership development program for 18 months. Um, I enrolled in that program having no idea about that aspect of it or about what any of that stuff meant. I just had people I loved and trusted were putting it on and I wanted to be a part of it. At the same time, my estranged 10 year old daughter moved in with me. So I lived in this developmental context while studying, studying development. So I really got just soaked in the Kool-Aid on this one. Mm -hmm. And um, I think of most of our models today are implicitly in large part that linear rational objective dynamic that I attributed to capitalism including the study of development. And I know that also most of the people I mentioned to varying degrees implicitly and explicitly are working with those developmental models in a way that integrates a greater plurality, a, a, a greater multidimensionality to the, to the, to the, proposed phenomenon. And, and that is what I mean when I say development. So when, when you say that you can have an exceptionally well-developed child and an exceptionally lowly developed adult, I wholeheartedly agree. And I think that because we have categorizing minds, that's one of the things we will continue to struggle with for a time in these models because I think that the developmental categories, or rather the categories into which I develop, are unique to me and an infinite set. And there's enough implicit overlap between you and I that a, a scientific observer can pick a piece of those infinite dynamic sets, freeze them in a mold and say, this is what they are and then measure your development and my development through that mold. And it has some bearing and value, but it doesn't ever touch the living, breathing, dynamic mystery that we are. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the high level piece I wanted to iterate because I do think it's important to, to keep in mind those dynamic motions of linear increasing capacity and skill in certain generalizable dimensions that help us frame structures for dialogue and interaction and collaboration with people that takes into account people's different developmental stages, whether it's their capacity to work with gunpowder or their capacity to design a warship. Mm -hmm. um, or their and capacity so, to entertain a new idea. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so then the, Taking it to the low level thing, the thing I, that came up for me to ask you when you talked about how do I make design from trust into a personal practice? So what if I say, I am your willing accolade and I have full faith in this design from trust thing. I think it's my path to God. 
like, but I never did anything like it. Mm -hmm. What are the first, what's the first, what are the preliminary practices mm -hmm. that you would advise me to take on and practice in order to start to familiarize myself with the things I need to become proficient in to design from trust as a personal practice? Um, do you want me to tackle answering that? Yeah. Cool. Uh, so as you're saying that, I'm realizing that I'm, I'm, I'm borrowing from plenty of existing traditions, right? When I said assume good faith, I'm borrowing that from open source software movements and, from, and they from elsewhere. This is not a new thought. Um, I'm also a fan of uh, Quaker thinking, basically the Religious Society of Friends. And one of their fundamental beliefs is that God is actually in everybody. God is like not a separate being that judges us from above and you know, all of those kinds of things. That, that, that they, uh, the reason that they at least used to use, um, what's it called, plain speak, I think, where they call each other thee and thou, was that the capital T, thee and thou was the holy in the other person. They were not trying to be pompous. They were, they, were, they were just speaking out of respect for the other and seeing that of God in them and in themselves in, in, the, in the present moment. And, and I think if, if we sort of, if we did that with humans and like your average rock and table, and we, if, we, if we treated the things around us with respect and dignity, a lot of other stuff easily sort of tumbles out the other end. That, that changes a lot of behaviors right up front. So, so I think there's, there's some piece of design from trust as a personal practice that's about reorienting the way you see things and treat things. And uh, Marty Spiegelman, who I, I might have described to you, uh, she uh, used to be a neurobiologist and is now a shaman, uh, basically teaches people the traditions of the Quechua and Aymara peoples of South America. She carries a couple other traditions as well. Um, but she's really good at sort of at, at, at taking people into this space um, of seeing differently. And she and I together have crafted a workshop we actually never given, but the phrase that we both aim toward in the one day workshop is see, be, do. So if you can see differently, you will begin to be differently and that will naturally make you do differently. Your actions will be different. And, and, and part of this is just trying to get people to see a little differently. And that means a lot of things to a lot of people that easily and quickly runs into belief systems, prejudices, fears, there's a whole bunch of stuff that, that can easily pop up. So there's a, a hundred really good questions about, okay, so how do you walk out to those waters? Um, how do you try this out without drowning? I think, I think sort of the, the flowing river metaphor is nice for, for, for changing your behavior, right? It, it's like, what, you want me to cross this, this like raging torrent river? And you know, unless I see that there's some steady rocks in the river, I'm certainly not gonna try it. And unless I see some other human who crossed and survived, I'm probably not gonna try it. And, but, but there might be like really great life across that river, across some behavioral change or some attitudinal change or whatever. So I think, I think behind this as a personal practice is, how do I, how do I change uh, some of that? How do, what kinds of things might I do to affect those sorts of things? So, um, can, can you stop for just a moment there? Sure. What kinds of things can I affect to change? Which things specifically? Um, your outlook toward the world, your approach toward things and people. So, for example, this may sound silly. Um, uh, the sillier version of it is something like free hugs. Um, but you know, random acts of kindness, or even just smiling at people. So, so I treat most conversations and most emails as an opportunity to make a, the other side smile a little bit. So, so I have a funny greeting and salutation that I just sort of developed over the years that I like, that's a little bit quirky and hopefully not too alienating, no, you know, hopefully not too weird as to be like, who the hell is this guy? And I will play with language. I will, uh, I, I, I don't think I'm, Teasing so much because teasing can be a little dangerous, but I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to be lighthearted when I'm in contact with other humans in a way that might make them a little bit happier in the day. That's simple, but that's an attitude, right? And and there's a lot of other people that are mostly just functional, um, and and there's some people who aspire just to clarity in their communications, and they just want every word to mean exactly what they mean, and 
for the details to all be there so there's not a lot of doubt at the other end as to what I said. And you and I probably both don't like it when you get a message that says, you know, great, I'll talk to you next Thursday at three. And you're like, what time zone? And, and does next Thursday mean this Thursday or the one after? Because <laughs> next, is, next is an ambiguous American word, English word, right? Things, things like that, right? So the clarity is a virtue too. Um, but, but I think behind here is, is some ways of, of, of being and of seeing and being that play out then in all different kinds of actions. Um, and, and behind that are narratives like the fact that long ago, I think we used to understand what the commons were, you know, that, that we live in the middle of a whole bunch of commons and that if we don't take care of our commons, uh, we actually don't, um, we may not survive, that the commons are something we have to care for together. Well, the model that we're, that we're living in, capitalism plus consumerism, basically turned the commons into natural resources to plunder and make things out of. So, so the model barely even contemplates the commons and usually then only when commanded to obey regulations about, mm. oh, you have to do this. So, so the model itself is out to plunder as much as it can for self for its own benefit with this, with this crazy narrative that there's an invisible hand. So it all works out. Okay. If everybody's greedy, which makes me nuts, but that's, that's like, you get a primitive take on capitalism and economics and that's what it is. Right. But, but it's true as long as, you know, the whole planet is desertified and uninhabited of life. You know, as long as that fits into your definition of okay. Exactly. It all works out okay I love that. Precisely. Precisely. Okay. Um, so, so those are some of the aspects of this. And, and I realize as I'm describing some of the things one might do, they're maybe kooky or idealistic, or they're maybe too broad, but there's, there's more specific things one can do as well. But if I reflect back, yeah. what I heard you saying, if I heard you in an essential sense, was the practice that you're advising is that I look for ways to lean up against the edges of my assumptions and my worldviews. And I go looking for the edges of my worldview so I can try a different one on. Maybe and, next door, maybe not too far away, maybe far away, but, yeah. but I actually look for the edges of my worldviews and I try to escape those boundaries or modify them in some way. And to be doing so with an intention of making things better with a real caution about what better might mean very much in the spirit of the conversation we just had about what is good and, you know, what one's intentions might be. So, so to be alert that when you think you're making things better, you might not be right. And I'm, I'm a hugger, but, but in these days of, of being cautious around people, you've got to ask permission for things like that and figure out where this all fits. Um, so, better isn't always better to everybody. And I think what I'm grateful for is that we're beginning to understand more and more where these things go wrong. Uh, although that awareness bubbling up has caused a lot of backlash in the world as well. So we're, we're, it's, it's all very messy. Uh, and right this minute, the waters are very turbulent because there's a whole bunch of emotion that's been you know, kicked up by the last electoral cycle and all of the messes that are sort of coming out from that before this last electoral cycle, these forces were present. They were just sort of quiet and suppressed beneath the surface. They, they existed. Uh, nobody had lanced the boil, so to speak. Um, so now, you know, these things are, have, have burst forth and are, are messy on the landscape. But that gives us opportunities to actually talk about them and deal with them. These are conversations we were not having before. Not enough, maybe. So... For me, staying with the, my question about what's my, what's my neophyte acolyte practice, what I think I hear you say is that the advice is that I, I look to discover if I have assumptions, and likely that I do. And when I find those assumptions, I look to test them and explore outside of them. And that as I continue to do this practice through my graduated stages of capacity with the design from trust practice, it's likely as long as I keep with that preliminary practice, those assumptions will become more complex and wider and they'll go from, I assume Tresa and 
Melissa are in the next room to, I assume, you and I share a value around transparency to, I assume, democracy will save the world. And that, that, so that's a line of practice that, that I might mm -hmm. take on in order to, to personalize a design from trust. I like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, there's also other smaller sounding things. Um, uh, one of the problems, one of the ways in which we've ended up with systems designed for mistrust is that we've taken away people's sense of agency. Uh, we've, you know, we've institutionalized a lot of things. We've, well, the word that got me here is the word consumer. By treating people as mere consumers and not as full humans and not as citizens, for example, our job as consumers is to buy stuff. And it's just not to consume stuff. Pardon? It's just to consume as, as stuff. As Lynn says, to use up, to deplete, to destroy. It's very Lynn twist, yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, if you've heard people talk about the difference between the linear economy and the circular economy and, and things like that, right? Um, so, so the assumptions of the consumer economy um, don't lead us toward the kinds of things that we're, that, that, that we're talking about. If I can just take us on a little tangent for a moment. Please. I used to be fascinated with this idea of an AI that would start to select for its own value set and would eat all the people, you know? And what struck me about a year ago is that we have such an AI. It's the capitalist system. It now writes its very own rules, mm -hmm. and it is it uses the entire planet and every living organism on it as its food. Feed stocks. And it runs out of control. And so actually the term consumer because what I want to address is the wellness of the human species. Mm -hmm. And implicit in that is then its ability to be well with all its living relations on the planet and the planet itself. And the cosmos beyond, but I'll be happy for us to just get along with the other plants and animals, for sure. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let alone one another. But the thing that has happened is something smarter than us this advanced intelligence called capitalism has started to write for us the narrative of ourselves and our lives. It's not human beings that call each other consumers. I have no reason in any context to refer to anyone else as a consumer of mine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or a consumer of my product. Mm -hmm. It's only when I'm in service to this capitalism superstructure that that becomes a meaningful definition. Yep. And so we're using terms, it seems, it strikes me in this conversation, that are actually not even terms created by the human mind. They're terms created by the capitalist mind. And, and, and making, discovering the distinction there seems like maybe a powerful point of inflection. Absolutely. Like what are, if we're going to design from trust, do we trust capitalism? Has it earned our trust? There's things, I mean, I'm, I'm typing and talking to you through a capitalist device that, you know, has are, you, are you a couple ounces of unobtainium and a Is it just really a capitalist device? It came, it, it arose from capitalism, did it not? Is it the only way it could arise? No, it's I mean, not. I, I don't mind that it's the yeah. only way it has arisen here right. on it. But to, to protect capitalism because we value our computers seems like a dangerous misstep. 
I totally agree. And just recently, somebody kind of reminded me of Milton Friedman's famous uh, pencil talk, where he says, and this is from his Free to Choose, or I think that was the name of the series he did on PBS way back when. This, this was a, you know, Milton Friedman has been a pivot point for, for how we think about the world. Um, and he says, this pencil is only, you know, you could not make this pencil. You know, thousands of people and hours and investment and everything went into the graphite and finding, cutting down the forests and painting the paint and the rubber at the end comes from a different place and this was all assembled and gotten to you at a price that's insanely low. Thank you, capitalism, which is the only way it could have gotten to you. And that's Uncle Milty's, you know, um, uh, phrasing for how this could happen. And I'm with you. I'm like, and uh, no, not so much. There's lots of other ways this might have happened. And before 1650, we had stuff and capitalism didn't really exist. So how did we eat and make tools and share and do stuff? Well, lots of other ways. I think so the thing I want to be careful of is that we don't... See, this is where developmental worldviews comes in to, to, to play for me. From the worldview of Milton Friedman, the only way this pencil could have come to exist is through capitalism. And that actually has a great deal of practical meaning and reality. And the fact that I can stand outside of that framework and say, I'll bet there are other ways, doesn't invalidate the legitimacy and the truth of that worldview in that space. It, 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 it diminishes its usefulness if I want to go forward and make pencils in another way, except by its example to avoid. Mm -hmm. But its example to avoid only has integrity if I'm willing to bring the whole thing as Milt cherishes it along with me for the ride. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so there's this For me, designing from trust, I think, means a lot about radical trust. Mm -hmm. Trust that trusts my enemy, trust that trusts death, trust that, that trusts that which will destroy what I love. That is super interesting. And it, if I can do that, then it, it frees a lot of energy, I think. Mm -hmm. And it might not be the kind of energy that will solve the problem I identify today by the time I die tomorrow. But I do think it frees the kind of energy that will advance a qualitative goodness for that set that I value, meaning all of life, further by the time I die tomorrow than me just getting the Lambo before I die. Mm -hmm. So there's like some tweaks of orientation in there about if I'm designing from trust, maybe I have to understand something about my goals. Right. I mean, uh, the word that's burbling up in my head right now, as you're saying these last couple sentences, is the word enough. Like, like, most of us don't understand when we have enough. And most of us have been raised in, with assumptions of scarcity and whatnot. And scarcity plays an interesting role throughout human history. But, but at this point, most of us don't understand enough. And we're not happy with enough. We're not, we don't stop at enough. Maybe enough is a deceptively simple word. Yeah, it's crazy, yeah. Because yeah. It's insufficiency is what destroyed the dinosaurs. Yeah. Insufficiency has killed more species than live on the planet today. Not enough has been the devastation of countless living beings. And we're well on our way to doing that to ourselves. Right. And so this concept of enough, it sounds simple enough. Mm -hmm. What does it really mean? Mm -hmm. 
but, but I think it runs deep and I think it's a practice point to make a, to, to pay a lot of attention to. Mm. Yeah. So designing from trust has the quality of a, a really soulful relationship to enough. Yeah. Hmm. I've been doing a meditation practice by a prescribed by a teacher named Dan Brown. Mm -hmm. His website is the pointing out way. When he describes the, uh, the meditation practice there, part of the setup, and he's got this in the library available on the site. Um, he says, in preparation for your meditation, think of a time when you really trusted yourself. Hmm. When you really knew that you had the intelligence and the skills and the capacity mm -hmm. to accomplish what it was you were setting out to do. And now, get a hold of that sensation of trusting in yourself and your capacities. And now bring that in as a tool for your meditation today. Mm -hmm. and that, that's lovely. That, like, that seems like, like that's the kind of trust I would want to have if I brought myself to you as a collaborator mm -hmm. to design something together. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. My device made of unobtainium is about to run out of uh, electrons. Other unobtainium, great. Yeah. Um, and also, like, this has been a really um, filling and like a rich conversation. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. I really feel the same way. I really appreciate you extending the invitation and bringing such a, a really kind of a high offering and letting us play with it. Thank you. There will be many more. Fantastic. It's a good journey. And and you just keep just noticing whoever happens to be in the vicinity. Whoever gets it, whoever ha happens to have a free hour when the call happens, whatever. I'm not, I'm not trying to book these or doodle them or anything like that. And, and as if you, if, if, um, if you are struck with, uh, with opening questions or with parts of this terrain that you would like us to talk about, send me, send me an email with a, with a framing of a conversation and I will put that to the group and right. we'll, we'll move that way because that's, it, it turns into whatever we all make of it. Dynamite. Super cool. Thanks for having me along. No, oh, thank you. Really appreciate it. Be well. Thank you. Thanks, Kabir.